Hi, thank you for watching this quick video about diverse learners and how we can help them succeed in the classroom and outside of the classroom, of course. We start um, their journey the minute that they're in our classrooms or the minute that we um, show that we care for their education. No matter what role you have, you might be a principal, you might be a teacher, you might be a paraeducator, whoever you are in your educator role, you um, for sure have a huge uh, impact in each and every child that you are in contact with. So thank you for watching this. Um, and I'm excited to share a few things that might be just some things to think about. They're simple, um, but I just really need to share with you um, what I've been thinking, okay? And I'll record other videos and we'll keep talking about this the entire uh, time, the entire year and years to come. But I'm excited to be your coach and to help you help your students, okay? Let me share this beautiful, colorful presentation. So our topic today is English language supports for diverse learners, all right? So I wanna emphasize the word supports. So we're supporting the students, but sometimes as educators, we need support ourselves. I find myself doing a lot of professional development, uh, going to the OSPI website, going to the PD enroller with the, um, uh, in the EDS system. Um, just, I can do just about anything and everything just to, to keep myself um, updated and engaged with the educational system because that's what we do. We need to always be on top of our um, game, right? So we can help the students. So we can know what to do to help them. So let's focus on supports and help helping those students. So before I tell you anything, um, you know, like what strategies I think you should do or not do, um, you will find your way every day, right? Oh yeah, I should do this. Oh, maybe I could try that. That's it. That's great. But what I'm going to tell you right now is important for you to really buy in. Um, the language learning process is a very complex process. If you've ever tried to learn another language yourself, um, you probably have found that it's not that easy, right? Um, personal story for you. I went to Italy this, you know, the year of 2023. And, uh, and then I went to France. Well, I speak Portuguese as my first language. English is my second language. And then Spanish is my third language. Well, I have not always been comfortable speaking all three languages. Portuguese, yes, because it's my first language. And I was born with everybody around talking to me in Portuguese. So that's my L1, my language one. But when I moved to the U.S., I was comfortable speaking English because that's, that had been all I, uh, you know, had been doing for over uh, 14 years by that time. I, I had studied English. I had majored in English. I had, you know, gotten my teaching certificate with a focus in, on teaching English language and so on and so forth. But Spanish, I wasn't very confident in 15 years ago or so. So... It was kind of like, oh, Angela, go teach in Spanish now at, at a middle school in the United States. And I was like, what? No way I can do that. Well, here I am, right? 15 years later, I am doing my thing. And it's amazing to be able to support students that speak other languages, not just because now I know how to speak the language, write, read, and, and all the four domains. It's not because of that. It's because now I understand the process that it takes to be a language learner myself to go through that. So if you have um, experienced learning another language or try to learn another language, you know how hard it is. So when I went to France and Italy, it was super hard to talk to other people because I was not proficient in those two languages. But 
I used my Spanish because the Latin root of those languages, right? They um, coincide. So I was bridging my knowledge of Latin roots in Portuguese and Spanish together. They didn't know that I knew Portuguese, but that's how I learned Spanish. And then that's how I communicated with them, especially in Italy. Okay. My taxi driver spoke. I don't even know what he was speaking. He wasn't speaking Italian and he was, he didn't speak any Spanish, but I had to speak Spanish to him so he could speak his best Italian at the time. If that makes sense. But we did communicate for about 45 minutes from Naples all the way to the Amalfi coast. It was incredible. He toured me around. He showed me all of the little places and things and little stores and drove me all the way there. So in situations like that is when you realize that knowing more than one language is an asset. Okay. So in school, we have what we call literacy skills, right? We want to develop the students' uh, skills to be as high as we can in reading and writing. But then we forget that there's also the oracy portion, the listening and the speaking, right? It's not easy to be able to understand listening, right? And speak right off the bat because it takes five to seven years for somebody to be proficient in another language. That's what research says. So we need to be very patient with our students and we need to scaffold not just the reading and the writing for them, but we also need to be patient with their speaking and listening skills because we think that they might understand what we're saying, but most of the time or sometimes depending um, on their level of development at that particular time, they might not. So it's important to understand that a student will advance in their second language at various rates. It is not common for a student to be on different levels in each of the domains. Second language learners may advance more quickly in the receptive domains of listening and reading. So they're receiving that information. So it's more like passive, right? Uh, then they do in the productive language domains of speaking and writing. Also, literacy skills may come later as they do for native speakers, but their instruction should not be delayed. You as an educator should help the student continue to be on track for the content and you should scaffold their language with the content and then that you're asking your, your, a question right now i know i know you're i know what you're thinking i can hear it and you're saying but how i'm so like oh my gosh i've tried everything i don't like when they speak in their first language in front of me because i don't understand what they're saying i don't know if they're saying a bad word or if they're actually talking to their peers about what i'm teaching is it disrespectful or what is going on, right? I hear you, I hear you from the other side of the screen. But sometimes speaking with somebody from the same, that speaks the same language is a way of scaffolding. So allowing them to speak first is a way for them to understand the content through the language. Now think of a baby. The first thing a baby does is they listen for several months the mom and the dad and everybody around speaking the language, they are acquiring all the sounds and, and the way that the language is um, put together. How, you know, sentences are formed, the grammar. If it's a question, what's the intonation of that question? How, you know, how it works, how language works. After a few months, they start babbling. By the age of one and a half, they should be talking. Uh, some babies talk even earlier than that and then they start walking and then their development of language with their uh, body development just skyrockets from there the same happens to a language learner no matter what age the process is very similar so allowing them to speak in whatever language they can will help them bridge those skills Now, let's think about student-centered supports. When teaching second language learners in the classroom, it's important to begin by analyzing their English competence in the four language domains, 
listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and not putting all four into one basket and saying, ooh, that student knows a lot, or that student knows nothing, okay? So it's important that you understand that. That person is not just one thing. That person has four different things going on as far as language learning, okay? And once you understand the linguistic competence of your students, as far as learning English as a second language, you can plan better. You can plan a purposeful instruction to support their advancement in each of the language domains separately while you're still making content comprehensible and students will not fall behind that way. So you have to be teaching language at the same time you're teaching your content, right? Now, I have um, this um, input chart right here. Those are just a few questions for you to think um, through the coaching cycle, right? Like when you're going through this moment in your life that you're like, how can I help my students better? So the first question could be, what do we want our students to know by the end of my lesson? So that would be probably related to your content. How will we know? when they're successful. So success criteria, how do we know they've learned? This is the PLC process. Even if you're not collaborating with other educators at the time because of time, because of the way your school is structured or whatnot, you can definitely um, think about those questions yourself. How we, will we scaffold the steps to success? Even if you teach online, how can you differentiate your online lesson, even if the system doesn't allow for that. What are little things you could do for that student to help with the next lesson that you're opening in the system for that particular student? The next one is, how do we find access points for all learners? So you're teaching a lesson on, let me think, um, maybe it's a history lesson, and it's gonna be about um, the westward expansion pioneers going west, right? How are you gonna find parts of that lesson or unit that you're going to be like, okay, I can differentiate this particular activity or this text that they're gonna be reading. And then you're going to have access. So give them access so that they can all have a chance to learn that content through language as well. Okay, sometimes it's easy for us to be like, oh, I don't know what's going on. The, the student is speaking Spanish in my class or Arabic or whatever language represented in your school. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, the student is in the office now because it was disrespectful the way that things happened in here. And I don't know what he or she was saying, but now guess what? The student is no longer in your classroom and is no longer having the chance to actually learn that content and you have no opportunities to engage with that student. So how do we find access points for all learners? That's that question. Next question is, what things do, do, we, do we anticipate needing to differentiate? How can we anticipate the learning? How do we know that they're already going to struggle with the next thing you're going to... Um, teach. So you already know the students a little bit. That, that's assume that that's the case. What are they going to struggle with and how are you going to help them before they struggle? And what strategies do we want to implement? Because it's, it's okay to have a problem in the classroom. So you, you know there's a problem. You can't get everybody to learn your content. Then you're like, okay, I need to do something. So it's not okay to just know that there's a problem, not solve it. So it is okay to think of strategies to make everything better. And that's why it's so amazing to be an educator because you can look at your student and think, wow, how can I help this amazing person in front of me to learn something fantastic? Because I know you've been an educator for a long time, for a while now. And that is why you're an educator, because you're not here for the money. You're here for that joy that comes from, like, actually making somebody learn. And that minute that they, like, that one moment, they're like, oh, wow, I get it. It's so rewarding 
that there's no money in the world that will pay for that. And I know that because I've been doing this for a long time. Of course, getting paid is important, right? And being recognized for your work and for the beautiful work you do, absolutely. But most of all, to be feeling that you matter is what makes you come back to work every single day. So let's make sure that we feel that way every single day together. Let's do this together. Another idea, so one of the strategies that you can use, um, it's um, a Dipl translation website. And if you scan this QR code, it, it will take you right there. Students can use their phones or you can have like a um, Chromebook or a computer station in your classroom, whatever you have. And you can have it already open there for them. They can go type in a word or they can just have access to that all day. Somehow they can translate words they, they don't know. It could be a content word. It could be a sentence and it's actually pretty wonderful, okay? So bilingual learners can access the, their first language, what we call L1, and second language, L2. So they can transfer from one language to another. So they, they do that all the time. We do that all the time. So I'm me being trilingual, um, I know that when I learned, I was learning Spanish, I had to lean into my knowledge of Portuguese and that's how I made better connections and I learned faster, okay? Some learners might know more than two languages. The more the merrier, the more knowledge, the more connections, the easier it gets to learn English. So when we say don't use your first language, we are denying them the access to their background knowledge and bring connections, okay? So that is not, um, a good way to go about it because they won't be able to make those connections in their brain and we're just not helping with the process, okay? So I would encourage you to allow them to make connections. So another idea is to provide scaffolding through the use of a graphic organizers because they foster language co connections. For example, they can transfer their skills from reading to writing by organizing their ideas. Um, I completely recommend 100%, and I will say that my students throughout the years benefited from that so much. So fostering developing of write, development of writing, grammar, vocab, language format, Etc. through the note-taking will absolutely help them move up to another level of learning. They need um, to see the text and they need to find ways to chunk the information into parts that make sense. Having a huge textbook and no way to actually um, create organized notes is a very difficult thing for English language learners. So any graphic organizer, I have um, the pictures that I posted here, are probably from like teachers paid teachers. I just pulled something from the internet. But of course, if you're teaching younger learners, then you would have something that would be appealing to them. If you have, you know, um, learners that in high school, you would have um, something that would look more like them. There's nothing wrong with those that I, I posted here. They don't have to look like ice cream, like, you know, or a little bubble with a little boy. Um, they can look um, the way you would like them to look. There's so much online uh, already created. You don't need to spend a lot of time um, creating your own, okay? And just to wrap up, I wanted to just point out a few things. Um, not just for the English language learner or for it, this is for any learner. What are the teaching methods um, that would be like the most, what teaching method is the most efficient and most engaging? Now that can also be an opinion, right? But according to research, 
um, once you teach a lesson, these are the percentages after 48 hours of retention of learning. So on top, you see passive teaching methods and then at the bottom, participatory teaching methods. So lecturing in your students with the content would be 5% of reten retention of that knowledge. So we want our students to learn what they're being taught, right? Not just passing their classes. We want them to learn for you know, the sake of learning. If you're just giving them something to read, they'll learn 10% of that content. They, they'll remember 10%. 20% would be audio and visual. So images, um, videos, um, internet, access connections like that um, could be a software, um, Dreambox, for example, for mathematics, for, you know, middle school, elementary school, for example. 30% would be demonstration. So you would demonstrate what they're learning, for example, a lab class, you know. Uh, discussion group is 50% because they engage in discussion with others and they get to talk about their opinion. Then 75% is practice by doing. So they're actually doing something like hands-on. So it's very exciting. And teaching others is 90% of the, the learning. So students should be teaching each other what they know. Once they become experts, they're, they're it. That's it. They become so excited and so uh, knowledgeable. They will not, 90% of what they've taught, they will not forget. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you so much for watching today. And I'll come back another time with um, some more discussions about um, language. Okay. Have a good one.